and welcome to Lunchtime Politics, reaching you live from our Lagos headquarters here in Nigeria's Commercial Nerve Center. I'm Jeffrey Uzanga, coming up on the program. Supreme Court reserved judgment in the River State governorship election brought before it by the APC candidate, Mr. Tony Cole, challenging the victory of Governor Simini Laie Fubara. Nigeria marks Armed Forces Remembrance Day to honor the memory of gallant officers who paid the supreme price in defense of our nation. National Assembly postpones resumption of plenary to January the 30th, altering legislative calendar of the federal legislature. Thanks again for joining us right here in our global headquarters. We begin the tracking of the polity of the first edition of the program for the week from the Supreme Court, where it has reserved judgment in the appeal filed by the governorship candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Mr. Patrick Tonye Cole, against the victory of the River State Governor Siminilai Fubara in the March 18 governorship election in that state. Mr. Tonye Cole's case is a fallout to the appeal court decision of November the 28th, which dismissed his appeal for lacking sufficient and convincing evidence. The APC governorship candidate's contention is that of irregularities, non-compliance with the Electoral Act, and Governor Fubara's continued signing of documents as the River State Accountant General after his nomination as governor or governorship candidate of the People's Democratic Party. Mr. Cole's appeal is against electoral body as well, the INEC, that's the Independent National Electoral Commission, the People's Democratic Party, as well as the governor. A five-member panel headed by Justice Kudirat Kekerekun reserved judgment on the appeal after all parties in the suit adopted their briefs of argument. The APS court also dismissed the appeal of innocent carrier of the Allied People's Movement, APM, after it was withdrawn by his counsel. At the moment, what you are witnessing is the special guest of honor being led by the Commander Gas Brigade to join other dignitaries that will be laying with this morning. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please have a view. In the meantime, President Bola Tinubu has performed a wreath-laying ceremony with other dignitaries to mark the 2024 Armed Forces Remembrance Day celebration in Abuja. All service chiefs led by the Chief of Defense Staff General Christopher Musa and heads of other security agencies were among those who took part in the ceremony. The program, which is organized yearly to commemorate the Nigerian fallen to mark or commemorate Nigerian fallen heroes, also witnessed other activities such as prayers, gun salute, and the releasing of pigeons at the National Arcade Eagle Square in Abuja. In attendance to witness the ceremony were members of the Federal Executive Council, members of the Diplomatic Corps, and other dignitaries.
to lay the reasons. And to every member of the armed forces, we thank you very much for your service. Let's move on now. The president of the Senate, Goswell Akbabi, is assuring the military of the support of the Senate in the war against insurgency. According to the Senate president, the support will include budgetary allocation to ensure that the number of servicemen is commensurate with the security needs of the country. We we're speaking at the interdenominational church service, which was held at the National Christian Center in Abuja, as part of activities to mark the 2024 Armed Forces Remembrance Day. We, as the, from the from the president and the National Assembly, we are very determined to give them all the resources they need to beef up their number. They, they, they don't have enough strength to combat the current uh, situation we are finding ourselves, and so they are understaffed and they are overworked. But we will do everything possible to provide, not just uh, the funding for the equipment, but also funding for, the, for extra personnel. And uh, that is already provided for in the 2024 budget. So we are ready to go. That's why I said Nigeria is a horse gallop, galloping on its own. I'm ready to move. And it's not a dead horse. The armed forces are doing their best. And away from the nation's capital, we head to Plateau State, where Governor Caleb Moftuang, who, was, who also won at the Supreme Court on Friday, has pledged to intensify efforts to see that the dividends of democracy is delivered to the people. The governor made the pledge during the reception in his honor at the Ling Field Leisure Park in just the Plateau State Capitol, describing the large turnout of people as a call to be more dedicated in providing good governance to the people on the plateau. The secretary to the government of Plateau State, Samuel de Tao, and members of the State Executive Council, as well as well-wishers, associates, party supporters, and citizens of Plateau, thrown to the Yakubugowon Airport, Haipang, to welcome the governor after the Supreme Court judgment of Friday, January the 12th, 2024, that affirmed him the governor of Plateau State. <laughs> Joyful citizens lined the routes from the airport through the major road leading to the reception venue where another crowd awaited his arrival. The former governor Jonah Jang alongside Ambassador Yahaya Kwande and party officials was there to receive him. Moved by the crowd that received him at the airport and reception, the elated governor expressed his gratitude to the people and reiterated his commitment to serve them. I want to appreciate all of you for this rousing welcome back home. Yes, sir. What it has done to me is that it has, it has sport me, it has energized me, it has provoked me that for the rest of my life, by the grace of God, I will live for the interests of Plato. The former governor of the state, Jonah Jang, commended the justices of the Supreme Court for restoring the people's confidence in the judiciary. He called on religious leaders to work at reconciling the people at all costs. We're not going to start making long speeches here today. But I want to plead with our religious leaders to pray and give back to this administration. Because the, the people of Plato said are God sharing people. They should live in bringing the unity of this state through their sermons and in the mosque or in the church. Now that the Supreme Court has validated the election of Caleb Mutwang as governor of Plateau State, before him lies the task of ensuring the safety and welfare of the citizens as enshrined in the Constitution. This is besides fulfilling the promises he made to serve the people well. Uh, that's uh, Governor Caleb Moftwang, uh, who won at the Supreme Court on Friday. He, he was not the only one. About uh, eight other governors, or seven of them, also were victorious at the Supreme Court. Now, thousands of residents and supporters of the new Nigeria People's Party, NNPP, thronged major streets to receive Governor Abba Yusuf after his governorship victory 
uh, the Supreme Court on Friday, January the 14th, uh, 13th rather, Governor Kaba Yusuf received a warm welcome as he came to Tamburawa, Dakwa King, Kudu and other areas of the state. The Supreme Court had on Friday affirmed Mr. Yusuf's election, setting aside the concurrent verdicts of the Court of Appeal and Election Petitions Tribunal, which nullified his victory in a March uh, governorship election that's at the polls on March uh, 18th in 2023. And uh, you can see crowds of people, the Kwankwasiya movement, thronging the entire street, welcoming uh, the governor, who, which this particular state was of interest to a lot of people of how things would turn because the court had actually sacked him at the tribunal as well as the court of appeal. But eventually, the Supreme Court said they were wrong in sacking him and reinstated him. So those are the crowd that welcomed him back into Kano State uh, after he returned back to Kano from Abuja. Massive number there supporting Governor Abba Yusuf. We're still expecting more judgment, as we uh, told you earlier, that court has reserved judgment in a couple of cases, including the, the latest, which is Rivers. We have Ogun coming, as well as other states. As soon as we get those stories and the break, we will be bringing it to you as soon as possible. But let's, let's get back to what happened on Friday, which is still fresh. A lot of people are still talking about it. There's still a lot of talking points from the judgments we saw that day. And I'm being joined in the program by a senior advocate of Nigeria, uh, Mr. Wahab Shitu, who is joining me right here in our Lagos studio. Mr. Shitu, thank you so much for coming on the program. Again, thank you for inviting me. I I'm sure you have a lot to say uh, about this judgment. And well, as much as time permits us, we were accommodated. So um, we've seen that a couple of judgments have come. Uh, Friday, we had about eight of them. But the day before, we had one which was a white bone. We had uh, court also reserving judgment and all of that. So, but a lot of people, was, the ones that stood out for them is the case of Plato and Kano. Maybe starting with Kano, what stood out for you? Well, I think uh, the Supreme Court has done justice to these matters and restored public confidence. You will see the you will see that this is where I, one instance where the judgment of the Supreme Court mixed with the expectations of the people, and then and when you see judgment of of a court of competent jurisdiction meeting with the expectations of the people, mm. I, it says a lot in terms of public confidence. It restores integrity in the judicial system and it fosters public confidence. So the kind of situation that you have mentioned, you can see from the reactions of the people to the judgment, the turnout of the people, that uh, the man declared the winner by the Supreme Court actually won the election. If you can see from, even from what you are, you are showing on your screen, that this, 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 this is a candidate who's, who's popular and they will emerge out of a popular process. So what that judgment has done is to restore public confidence in our judiciary. And each time public confidence is restored in our judiciary, some of us feel very fulfilled. You should, be, you should feel very fulfilled because the alternative to lack of confidence is anarchy. Mm. If we practice democracy, the central to the democratic tradition is respect for the authority and integrity of the court. People must have confidence in the court if our, uh, our democracy is to flourish. So anytime people lose his confidence in the court system, he sends you know, dangerous signals. So, uh, so when confidence is restored and enhanced, as we have seen in the various judgments uh, you know, handed down by the Supreme Court, democracy will flourish. Rule of law will flourish. Respect for constitutionalism will flourish. 
and people will have confidence in our goodness and a resource to self-help will also not be the order of the day. So, and people, so, so by extension, you're saying that um, the public perception, yeah, there's, a, there's a bit of a rethink with this judgment. Of course, I'm, I'm saying that there's a bit of a rethink, like you have said, and that's the reality. And uh, in, the, in, in, some, in, in, in some instances in the past, people express reservations, but you know, suppose lack of confidence. But that confidence is restored 100% now. I've always had confidence in the judiciary, and perhaps maybe as a member of the Inoba. But it is not for me, it's what the ordinary man in the street mm. perceives about the you know, workings of, uh, uh, of the judiciary. Right. So you can see now that there's jubilation in Kanu, jubilation in Plato, and all other areas you know, arising from the fallout of this judgment. So okay. the Supreme Court ought to be commended, ought to be saluted for restoring uh, people's confidence in the judiciary. Let's begin to get to some of the nitty gritty of uh, uh, the, the case. Now, maybe without so much details now. I remember that when Justice John Okoro was reading his judgment concerning uh, the Kanu case particularly, I want to read what he was quoted to have said. Judges should be more meticulous in, their, in doing their job to avoid the mess that came with this case. What do you make of that statement? Well, that's a strong indictment. It's all, it, it can also be interpreted to mean a very strong message from the Supreme Court. You know, the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. Uh, if it hands down a judgment, you cannot appeal anywhere. And then you take your appeal to God. So when the, to, so the Supreme Court is a court of law, is a court of equity, is a is a public policy court. So whatever pronouncement is made at that level is a, is, is law. It's not some, it's something that cannot be challenged. It's something that will serve as a precedent, not only to judges uh, down uh, below the hierarchy, mm. but also lawyers who who make use of the court system in their daily activities. So we now know, so what they, what they have said, meticulous. Judges you, 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 are, well, you can't do, not every from the Kahari can become, but can be a judge. For you to be a judge, you must be detailed, you must be meticulous, you must be painstaking, and then you must have some mastery of the law and all other, you know, qualities of a judge. Uh, and that is what the Supreme Court has retreated so that when, a, when, when judges do not manifest all those attributes, it becomes an embarrassment to the judiciary. And if the judiciary is embarrassed, democracy is endangered. Rule of law is endangered. Cons respect for constitutionalism is endangered. And the end result of that is anarchy looms. Okay. Uh, I don't want to dig further on that particular issue. So I know you did mention that this is the first time, or this is one of the times. You, uh, this I, is one of the, I, I, I yes, won't say this yes, is the first time. This is one, this of, one the of the times, yes. This is one of the times. And when, I feel very, very when, proud. Yeah, yes. when more like the sentiment of the people aligns with the judgment of the court. So mm -hmm. the question I, I want to find out from there, it, sometimes is it that the court looks at the potential, probably potential of instability his judgment may cause. So it looks strictly at uh, justice according to, the, according to the law. What exactly? Let me make it very clear. Yes, that I want that clarity. Judges at all times apply the law according to, is justice according to law. That is, that is the principle. Mm. Justice according to law, which is the fundamental principle that underlies judicial decisions, might not necessarily agree with public sentiments. Might not necessarily agree with bare parallel gossips or public expectations. But, but when it agrees with public expectations, it is more salutary. But in those instances where it does not agree with public expectations, it doesn't mean it is wrong. It, it just means that, oh, Law is not synonymous with public expectations. You must get that clear. Uh, but in this case, this is one case that has shown clearly that uh, law can rise to meet the demands of justice mm. as well as satisfy public expectations. Let's leave Kano for a second. Let's, let's talk Plato. Uh, and it, it's, it got a lot of people thinking. Uh, everybody was 
trying to process that whole judgment because the judgment that has now been reversed by the Supreme Court is the same judgment that has seen the ousting of two senators at the Court of Appeal now because their cases enter the Court of Appeal. I mean, uh, members of the National Assembly. The court reversed the judgment that sacked Governor uh, Caleb Moftuan. Now, that's, it was based on that particular issue that two senators, five members of the, I wish I could have their, their names on the screen, two senators, five members of the House of Representatives, and four state assembly members of the PDP in Plateau State. So those, those are the, those are the uh, gentlemen who are no longer members of the National Assembly uh, from Plateau State, members of the House of Reps and Senate, as well as 14 members of the House of Assembly. If only they had, their case had gotten all the way to the Supreme Court, it's just that the law doesn't allow it, probably they would have had their seat intact and they would be representing their people. Is there anything the law can do to ever rectify this kind of situation? Because now the Supreme Court has said the lower court was wrong in their decision. Well, if the Supreme Court has said the lower court is wrong in their decision, then the lower court is wrong in their decision. The Supreme Court is not, is not final because it is infallible. But it is infallible because it is final. What that translates to mean is that the Supreme Court is the final court of the land. When it comes, the entire judiciary catches cold. That is the, that is the oracle, the apex court. And if the apex court has said, oh, the court of appeal was wrong, then the court of appeal was wrong. But uh, you see, we should appreciate the fact that the, the, the way the law functions, uh, every court has jurisdictions to be right, as well as jurisdiction to be wrong. Okay. You know what I mean? Yes. There is no court that, was, that, that is perfect. The Supreme Court is a judge perfect because it is the final court. It doesn't mean that in some cases it does not make mistakes. So if in this situation, so in this situation if we it, agree that the Supreme Court is right because it's a final court. But yes. Okay. And so if we take it on that, uh, on that premise, okay. that the Supreme Court has said, oh, the court of appeal was wrong. And then sitting here, I will agree with the Supreme Court that the court of appeal was wrong. All right. And there are a lot of justification for that. Okay. okay. For instance, the Supreme Court said, oh, it is not the business of, of our court to look into pre-election matters. Pre, uh, our parties conduct, conduct, conduct their, their, activities. Their, their activities. One. Okay. Secondly, you, you, you cannot unilaterally in a democracy uh, I mean disrespect the overwhelming wishes of the people. What you say? Okay. But when you want to crit critique any judgment, you critique it on the, on the index of justification. Okay. Uh, now, if you are going to look at it critically, what the Supreme Court has uh, laid down agrees with precedent and it's it, it makes our law uniform and predictable. Okay, uh, uh, Leonard Silk, uh, there's a lot to talk about, but I'm totally out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I must thank you so much for coming on the program, uh, Mr. Wahab Shitu, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Always we're calling on you to help us make sense. And more judgments are coming. We're going to call you to make sense of those judgments. No, as well. I'm very happy. Law is only relevant if uh, it is understood by the majority of our people. And some of us are committed to that process. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the program. It's a pleasure. We'll take a quick break now. When we come back, we'll bring you just a few more stories and then we'll wrap up the program. Join us again. Welcome back. The National Assembly has postponed the resumption of its plenary for the year 2024 to January 30th. The lawmakers have spent extra two weeks on duty to fast track the passage of the 28.7 trillion naira budget for 2024 and had previously fixed January 23rd for their resumption. However, in a statement by the clerk of the House of Representatives, Mr. Yahaya Danzari, addressed to all members a new resumption date was indicated as June, January 30th. Although reasons behind this postponement was not explained in the statement, the delay in the resumption of the plenary sessions will mark a shift in the legislative calendar of the National Assembly.
Vice President Kashim Shetima is in Davos, Switzerland, where he will be leading Nigeria, has led Nigeria's delegation to the 54th World Economic Forum. A statement by the Senior Special Assistant to the President of Media and Communications, Office of the Vice President, Mr. Stanley Nkwacha, it says Senator Shetima will join other political and business leaders across the world at the annual forum to discuss global socioeconomic and development issues. The Vice President will also chair a roundtable dialogue on Nigeria's economic path and attend a special session dedicated to building trust in the global energy transition program. And that's it on the program. Thank you so much for your time. And of course, your usual company, I'm Jeffrey Uzama. You've been served. Lunchtime.